our scribe up. Who's scribing today, Jamie? Thank you. I've, I've got a prayer request for my first wife, Mary Lou Faulkner. Yes. Uh, she had surgery uh, Wednesday of last week, and uh, she had uh, a uh, squamous cell carcinoma on her hand between the thumb and this finger. And they took 10 stitches. Uh, it is a gruesome thing to look at. Uh, of course, it's all bandaged and so forth, and she has to take it off and all that. But I'm going to pray for me, too. I'm having to do the dishes. I'm having to wash. I'm having to vacuum. I am a saint. Make the bed. I made the bed. It's everything. I'm it ain't safe not to pray for Mary Lou, but for him. <laughs> yeah. But she's real, seriously, she really had a time. But she's fine. Good. Yeah. Good. Uh, praises. Praises. I think a praise for Mary Lou. Oh, yeah. She keeps us in touch with each other, yes. keeps us informed, and that's, I don't know what we do without her. I know, yeah. that's right. right. It really does. Uh, our son, Steve, put his name down for us. All right. Others? Al, do you know Paulette Andrews? Um, she broke her leg. It's been a couple of weeks now. Oh, but it's, you know, she still can't put any weight on it. Mm. Mm. Not in our class, but how's Cammie Wagner doing? Has anybody heard? Cammie is, um, is improving very slowly. She's still suffering from pain in her upper back, and she's going to rehab, scheduled to go to rehab this week. So uh, hopefully they'll be able to help her progress further. And where is she right now? She she's been in the hospital at Northside Cherokee, and yeah. she's going to a new place. It's Salud. called Salud. Salud is the name. Five eighty five. Okay. Yeah. So hopefully they'll be able to help her a lot. Yeah. Uh, so the cards were sent to her home, or yes, yeah, cards to her cards. home are delivered to her. Okay. She appreciates them very much. Yeah, okay. I talked to her several days ago, okay. and uh, she's sounding better. You know, she's a fighter, so she's coming back. And it's just going to take some time. Uh, Ken mentioned to me this morning, Abe Cassis, who we've prayed, prayed for in the past, he's driving now, which is oh, good. good. Okay. But his wife, Julie, is having pacemaker surgery coming up this week, uh, next week. I think the 13th, Julie. Um, a good friend of mine's sister-in-law has cancer. Her name is Jeannie. Um, I don't know her last. I don't know her sister-in-law's last name, um, but I know the Lord does. So if we could just pray for her. Okay. Well, I ran into Greg Wackey this morning out yeah. in the parking lot, and um, I couldn't think of his first name, so I said, "Good morning, Mr. Lackey." You know, we <laughs> smiled. Anyway, we started talking, and finally I asked him. I said, I know your name. I can't remember it. But he said that he has just taken early retirement, and he's on disability, so okay. that's good. Yeah. But he said he had a, a book in his hand, and he was ready to go in and help. Um, who did I tell Doug you? Ray. <laughs> Doug Ray. Doug uh, Ray. Teach the youth, I think. So I thought that was great. That's yeah. wonderful. You know, he seemed real up. He that's seemed great. Really great news. Other prayer requests? Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Dear Father, we thank you for this day, for the breath of life, for our church and for our Sunday school and for those who teach and minister and help us all to do what we are inclined to do and to use the gifts that we have to reach out to our members and to all others that we come in contact with this coming week. And bless Wallace as he brings the lesson to us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Ready? Is everyone doing the, uh, the roll? I'll go get it. Oh, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Pretty good crowd in here. Uh, we are in a, you know, I was talking to Bill Roller not too long ago, getting my lesson ready, 
And I said, you know, Bill, this lesson is so familiar to everybody. It's the road to Damascus. We all know it, but I never fail to get excited over hearing it, reading it, listening to it, reading it over and over again, and I felt the same way this time uh, on the road to Damascus. Uh, if I had to subtitle this, I would say meeting someone famous. Uh, has anybody ever met anyone famous? And when I say really met them, have you shaken their hand or, or patted them and uh, have they spoken to you? Well, I have. What about you, Ken? You said? Liberace. You met Liberace? <laughs> okay, all right. Claim the fame. Uh, you claim the fame. He lost his ring, his piano ring. Yeah. Piano ring. Down in Charleston, South Carolina, where I was staying at a hotel one day. Oh, darn. And he was trying to find it, and he, uh, he was asking everybody to. Uh, Great. <laughs> well, I met someone famous many, many years ago, and I think it's really, and it's right in, in the lesson today. Uh, I, my dad, we, I was born in Columbus, Georgia, for, and my dad, I was convinced, he held up one end of the First Baptist Church in Columbus. I mean, he was in all of it. And one time, a very, very famous man came to do the revival. And uh, I was 10 years old. And uh, all the church, all the ladies had fixed everything up, the flowers and the food and so forth. And this very distinguished guest was coming in. And my dad, I can close my eyes and see it now, he was walking around introducing uh, Dr. McKinney to all of the people that were there. And uh, he said, Wallace, come over here. I want you to meet B.B. McKinney. And uh, I said, oh, great mean anything to me, but I, I went over there and he said, and, and Dr. McKinney said, how are you doing, Wallace? And he shook my hand and I said, I'm doing fine, sir. And then I walked away. I was really more concentrating on tomorrow. I've got my bicycle. The guys we're all going to meet, we're going to ride all over the neighborhood like we always do, and I'll be glad to get home. Well, little did I know that, and you all know B.B. McKinney. You may think, I don't know him, but listen. Dr. B.B. McKinney wrote words and music to 149 hymns. 149, the words and the music. He wrote things like, let others see Jesus in you, which you've sung a hundred times. I'm satisfied with Jesus. Uh, Wherever he leads, I'll go. Serve the Lord with gladness. Have faith in God. And on and on. But my very favorite is breathe on me. I love that. And I have sung it all over the place. So Dr. McKinney was a very famous person that I met, but I didn't know he was famous. But now, later on, and I was telling uh, Tyler about it a couple of, oh, maybe 10 years ago. And I said, Tyler, uh, you know, you heard of B.B. McKinney? Tyler said, you fool, you don't think I heard of B.B. McKinney? Blah, 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 blah. Of course, Tyler knew all about him. Well, he was a great guy, and he did pass away. He was hit, uh, had an automobile accident about 20 years after that, and was killed in the automobile accident. But today, we're on meeting someone famous, right on the subject. We're in Acts, the ninth chapter, one through nine, and 17 through 20. Uh, this is Paul's encounter with God. Um, and, and, but before we get into the lesson, I want to tell you about some of the things uh, that about Saul. Saul was born in the province of Cilicia in the city of Tarsus. Now, Tarsus was a Roman territory. That is very important. For Paul. At his birth, Saul, not Paul yet, Saul was automatically made a Roman citizen. Now, that is important because on several occasions, having being a Roman citizen saved his life on several occasions. So at his birth, he was automatically made a Roman citizen because of his birthplace. And like I said, he's going to use that to his advantage. Saul 
you know, you can glean things. It's almost like being a detective sometimes when you try to figure out where these people are coming from. Saul obviously came from a well-to-do family. Well, how do we know that? Well, his parents sent him at a very early age to Jerusalem to study under the famous Rabbi Gamaliel. Gamaliel only took promising, exciting students. He had a very limited, and Gamaliel was well known. He was the, the famous, famous rabbi in Jerusalem. So Saul was extremely bright. He, and when he became very educated under Gamaliel, he could speak Greek fluently, Hebrew, and Aramaic. Now, Saul acquired another trait, and that trait was an intense hatred, hatred for Christians. He wanted them all eliminated. He was obsessed. He was present, and he witnessed the stoning of Stephen, you know that story. Stephen, one of the very first deacons. Stephen was a wonderful, wonderful man, a wonderful Christian. And, and uh, Saul sat there, stood there, and as the men were stoning Stephen to death, he, they put their clothes down at his feet. And he, he may have thrown a stone, we don't know, but we know that he relished being there and seeing the stoning of, of uh, Stephen. Now, anytime you want to ju jump in on anything, don't hesitate. That's, that's fine. Uh, so he had this huge, huge hatred, hatred for uh, Christians. Uh, the Bible tells us that he held the outer clothing of the murderers as they stoned Stephen and that he may have even participated in throwing the stones himself, his hatred for Christians was intense. Now let's get into the passage today, if you've got it ready. Uh, it's a very important passage, and one quite familiar to you Bible scholars. We're in Acts, the ninth chapter, one through nine, and 17 through 20. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder, against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the Christian cause, men or women, he might bring them bound back to Jerusalem. Now, as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Saul asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. Verse 7. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him <coughs> into Damascus. For three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. So Ananias, Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul, and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who you appeared, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes, and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized, and take, after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days, he was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, saying, he is the Son of God. Let me ask you a question here today. 
why? What was it about Damascus that, that Saul wanted to go? Why Damascus? Because in Jerusalem, the Christians were being beaten up, they were being stoned, they were being thrown in jail, and Christians knew that there was a town 140 miles away in Damascus that was befriending and welcoming the Christians. So they went there in droves. And, of course, Saul knew that. And so, I mean, it, the plot thickens. He knew it. Barclay says that in this passage that we have just heard, the, it was the most famous conversion story in history. It was the most famous conversion in history. This was not only a sudden conversion, but also a sudden surrender. He was converted and he surrendered to Jesus. Saul had persecuted Christians and had done so in the most violent action possible. The very reason he was on the road to Damascus with his army of cutthroats was because he knew so many Christians had fled in terror from Jerusalem to Damascus, a haven for Christians. So when you think of Damascus sometimes, think of it in a very fine way. Damascus, as I said, was 140 miles from Jerusalem. They didn't have uh, SUVs. They didn't have uh, anything like that. So it would take generally about a week to get to, uh, to Damascus from Jerusalem. And it was a journey on foot for most of them. Now, there was a very large armed guard going with Saul. Saul was probably on a donkey or a horse of some kind because he was you know, important. And there may have been some around him, but the, there was a very large uh, uh, entourage with Saul going to Damascus to take these people, to bound them, men and women and children, and bring them back to Jerusalem to be persecuted. Uh, in the best of conditions, it would have taken at least a week to get there. Paul's, com and Paul's companions were the officers of the Sanhedrin. And we know that the Sanhedrin was the Jewish governing body, uh, made up of uh, 70, 70 plus one. Uh, it was the Jewish uh, ruling body with enormous authority. They were a kind of police force. As they approached Damascus, they found that it was a fine-looking city. A, <coughs> excuse me, a guy uh, uh, described Damascus as a white city in a green plain, a very beautiful, beautiful city. In our passage that I just read, we were introduced to this man named Ananias. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Ananias and hear this very familiar passage, and then let's see how we feel about his encounter with Jesus. Now, there was a man in Damascus named Ananias, a Christian follower of Jesus. The Lord spoke to him in a vision, calling, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he replied. And the Lord said, go over to Straight Street, and found the house of a man named Judas and asked there for Saul of Tarsus. He is praying to me right now, for I have shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying his hands on him so that he can see again. But Lord, explained, exclaimed Ananias, I have heard about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem. And we hear that he has arrest warrants with him from the Sanhedrin, authorizing him to arrest every believer in Damascus. Class, before you and I judge Ananias, hear this case in point. God is asking Ananias to approach a criminal, a murderer, and to touch him. So what is it to Ananias? The answer 
bottom line is the reply of Jesus to Ananias after his meltdown. The Lord replies, listen to me, Ananias, go and do what I say. For God, for Saul, is my chosen instrument to take my message to the nations and before kings as well as to the people of Israel. God spoke to Ananias and told him where to go and what to do. Go to a certain street, see this man named Saul, put your hands on him, and this man will immediately have his sight restored. I noticed something as I was writing this lesson, and you may have also noticed it. God, through his son Jesus Christ, uses other people to do his desires. Now, God could have done all of this. I mean, there's no problem. He could have done all of that by himself, but God wants others to do his bidding many times in order. Why? Why are we supposed to do his bidding sometimes when he could do it himself? Why? What are we doing? Being obedient. We are being obedient. Anything else? Right. We are also witnessing. Witnessing. Have you ever witnessed to people? I know I have a lot. One thing, I talk a lot. And I go in stores and I talk to people. And when I talk to people, I get in trouble with them and they, I have to witness to them and they <coughs> witness to me. One time I was in uh, oh, the bookstore. What's the chief bookstore? Yeah. Well, one Barnes and Noble is the uh, the so one that you. South Asian armies where you go. Yeah, so, yeah, <laughs> right, that. And I was in there, and and it was two o'clock in the afternoon, and Mary Lou had gone to a meeting or something, and she had fixed a nice meal for me, and I just left out. I left around eleven o'clock, and it was around two. I hadn't even gone home to eat, and so my phone rang, and I answered it, and it was Mary Lou. She was uh, so concerned. She had gotten home. And I was talking to her, and I said, no, everything's fine. I'm talking like this. I said, I'm doing real fine. I said, yes, uh, yeah. And she said, well, I love you. And, so forth. and I said, I love you too, honey. Everything's fine, and I'll be home in a little while. Bye-bye. I love you, sugar, and hung up. This lady heard me about as far as from here to Ann, and she came up to me, and she said, sir, you don't know me, and I don't know you, but I cannot believe how wonderful it is to hear a man speak to his wife in such a wonderful way. It really made my day. <laughs> she, what, you know, we witness when we don't know we're witnessing. Do we witness good? Sometimes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Do we witness bad? Sometimes. Sometimes, that's right. And if you say, I've never witnessed bad, I have problems with you. <laughs> okay, let's see what Luke's account of what happened to Saul after his conversion. <clears throat> Paul remained with the disciples in Damascus for quite some time. Immediately, he began to preach Jesus Christ in the synagogue, right there in Damascus. Everyone who heard him were astonished. Is this the man who bound men and women and brought them before a tribunal? Our pastor, Dr. Head, has been in Galatians uh, all last month. He was in Galatians the entire month of May, and he mentioned some salient facts about Saul's conversion to become Paul. And I took notes. I said, boy, anytime Kevin is talking, I'm going to take notes. One, he said Saul <clears throat> was converted on the road to Damascus where he was going to arrest Christian men and women and have them return to Jerusalem in chains. Well, we knew that. Secondly, after his conversion on the road to Damascus, he began a preaching in that very city. Well, that's true. Three, Paul preached in Damascus for three years. Wow, three years in a town that he was going to, he was going to have them all bound in chains, men, women, children, bring them all back to Jerusalem to be persecuted, and now, He's there preaching God's word in Damascus for three solid years. And Paul goes back to Jerusalem to find his life in danger, and he escapes to Caesarea. The Jews had plotted to murder him. 
the study guide uh, brought up a, a wonderful message. When Jesus had him fall to his knees on the road, Saul's plans changed. Literally, in the blink of an eye, his plans changed and his name changed to Paul. And as I said, as, and as Dr. Barclay said, it was the greatest conversion story in history. And that's the lesson. Uh, any comments on what, how many people did we have here today? Mary Little asked me. 17. 17, good, good. Uh, well, if, if we're not, have anything else to say, I'll just close this out with a prayer. I, and yes, yes, Ann. I just think it's interesting that Saul said, who are you, Lord? Yeah, yeah. he didn't know. And of course, Jesus immediately told him. It, it, that is interesting. Who are you, Lord? Well, you know, and he did say Lord, mm -hmm. which meant this is somebody high ranking because he has knocked me around on the ground. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Yeah. What else you think? Well, Saul was a rule keeper. <clears throat> Obeyed the rules, and that makes you just fine. <laughs> and, he was, and he was trained by Ga Gamaliel yes. to be just like that. <clears throat> Super intelligent guy. Can intelligent guys be stupid? <laughs> can dumb guys be stupid? <laughs> we can all do things sometimes. We do things we, well, I've always said to when I pray, uh, God forgive me for the things that I've done that I shouldn't have done and the things that I haven't done that I should have done. You know, it's just that the, the uh, you, we're human, we're human. Okay, if not anything, any other comments? Okay, well, let's just have, have a word of prayer. Thank you, Father, for allowing us a time together in your house. Let us take away from the lesson the knowledge that you, dear Father, can take a terrible person and convert that person into one of the greatest Christians who ever lived. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for all the wonderful things you do for us it's wonderful to live in this country. We pray for the country. We pray for the people who are in government, uh, Republican or Democrat. We need you, Lord. The world needs you. And we thank you and we love you. Amen. 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 Amen.